Hello and uh, welcome to this Tech Talk. This is the third in our series of Tech Talks. Uh, previously we've discussed uh, artificial intelligence and blockchain and today we're going to be talking about cybersecurity and cyber risk. My name is Mark Taylor. I work here within the IT faculty at the Institute and today I've been joining by a couple of colleagues as well. Kirsten, if you'd like to introduce, introduce yourself. Yes, my name is Kirsten Gillen. I work in the IT faculty also with Mark, and I'm responsible for a lot of our thought leadership and research and policy work around technology and the profession, particularly working on cybersecurity in the last few years. Lovely, thank you. Paul. Uh, good, good, morning. good morning. Um Well, first of all, I am a chartered accountant and member of the ICAW. Um, I've participated in various things, particularly the IT faculty over the years, but I spend my, my daytime um, providing cyber security and GDPR consultancy and advice to organisations and assessing businesses to the cyber essentials uh, security standard. Okay, lovely. Thank you. Thank you for joining us this morning. Um, so to start off, uh, why is cyber uh, security important? Kirsten, if I can uh, start with yourself. Well, as you said, Mark, cyber security is one of our four key strategic technologies. Mm -hmm. And we think it's important fundamentally because it's about business risk. And it's a really key risk for all businesses today. As technology gets so more and more important and we are so more reliant on it, the impact of security breaches is just getting greater. That's financial impact, impact on reputation, client relationships, customer relationships business disruption, and also um, increasingly compliance risks. So in terms of managing those risks, cybersecurity is important. Information security has always been important, of course, but cybersecurity is going more and more up the agenda, and we've seen that in the last few years. Mm, good. Paul, how, what's, uh, what are your thoughts on the importance of cybersecurity? Well, as Cousin said, you know, there's a lot of legal responsibility that business owners and business organising managers need to make sure that they are looking after and safeguarding their data properly. And you, you do see different levels of understanding of, of that responsibility. I think one of the ways of looking at it is that we're very good at physically locking our offices, mm. our homes. Yes. Um, we are, we've got a very strong mindset in that respect. Mm. Even in perhaps locking filing cabinets for sensitive data, we need to have the same kind of mindset when it comes to digitally locking our data and maintaining that vigilance as well. Yeah, just become part of your daily business. You lock the front door, ensure your IT systems are secure as well. Exactly. Yeah. Okay, yeah. good. Um, Paul, if I could start with you. So what, what are the uh, principal external threats that we see today uh, facing firms of, of all sizes? Um, well, they are continuously changing, that, that, that we are aware of. And what's as interesting, the, one of the latest government um, surveys came out that we are we're seeing less threats overall, but we are seeing more threats within individual organisations that have succumbed to a threat. So once you have succumbed to one threat, you are more likely to mm -hmm. succumb to others. Um, so you've got to, to make sure uh, that the points of entry are being safeguarded. And it's generally speaking, email, that is the, the, the principal right. source. Right. Well, that can manifest into lots of different things, depending upon the state of your own system. So mm. you will almost certainly have some vulnerabilities in your system, no matter how hard you try, mm. there's going to be something perhaps there, I and mean, the more vigilant you are, the better. The email that comes in may have an attachment, it may lead you to a website. It will depend, um, it could be something like ransomware that takes, takes a grip, it could be remote control that takes a grip. It will depend on the nature of the vulnerabilities and how secure your systems are. Mm. But one thing's for certain, it keeps changing and it won't be going away in a hurry. It's always evolving, yeah, yeah. Kirsten, any other thoughts about uh, the experience? Yeah, threats? I mean, I think it's just the range of threats that are out there at the moment. Um, and we see in the papers and the media all the time about these kind of high profile, big data breaches from large companies and mm. banks and governments. They're constantly being, being attacked, often by very sophisticated actors. And we see the personal data breaches and all this kind of stuff. But equally, when we look at and we speak to our own members working in smaller organisations, they're also experiencing attacks, particularly ransomware. We've seen a lot of that in the last few years. Mm. And also the sort of CFO impersonation fraud, again, particularly working in finance functions, that, that comes up, up a lot for, for in professional services. So we see that kind of range of threats from the kind of really sophisticated and high profile to things that are also very much affecting smaller business. So everyone is, has got to think about it. In that Anyone sense. with data is exactly. vulnerable. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Interesting. And um, so, Paul, uh, what are the uh, uh, major um, sources of 
of data breaches today? What are the main, you mentioned email is a routine. And I think e email is still the principal routine. Mm. Um, websites that have been um, infected or corrupted in some way is another way. And there's a lot of um, concern over ads that you see on websites. They might be coming from a, 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 an unofficial source, shall we say, that have got some code in there that are not doing quite what you expect it might do. Um, but we've also got emailing um, going out, where uh -huh. people are, um, one of the things that we see an awful lot is where the compromise has happened within somebody's email account. And that may be someone along the supply chain. Uh, one instance we have, um, there's a particular um, client where there was a transaction going on. They thought it was their system that had been compromised, but it wasn't, it was the, um, the customer um, and the, well, actually the supplier in this case, because they were making a big payment out, and they sent an email in, a very typical type of thing you see at last minute, saying, oh, can you just use yeah. this bank account information yeah. because we've just made a quick change. Sorry, I forgot to tell you. Mm. Fortunately, having been bitten once, this particular organisation then phoned and found out it was fraud. But it was clearly weak passwords and this particular email account with the particular supplier that caused the problem. Right. And so passwords still seem to be um, not quite where they need to be. So no. my, my, my takeaway from this would be use a password manager. Right. If you use a password manager, you are going to be much safer. Yeah. And you can use those across an enterprise as well, across mm. an organisation. I saw a survey the other day that talked about how the most popular password was still password and 123 and Manchester United and all this sort of stuff. And of course, with a password manager, you can use complex passwords, which you don't have to necessarily immediately remember. You can use those to, uh, um, a password manager to help you uh, remember those complex passwords. I, well. I rarely remember any of my passwords for some of the sites I use now because I use a password manager and they can be 20 characters long. So yeah. touch wood, no one's going to get through that. <laughs> well, I hope not. Yeah. Uh, Kirsten, any other thoughts on the, the yeah, data breach sources? Just, I think just to add, you know, just to reinforce the fact that so much of this is about people. And we talk about cybersecurity as about technology and we often think, oh, this is about IT and it's about technology. But it's not. It's actually about people mm. and, you know, and, and having good passwords and not clicking on things. So much of it is about people. And just, you know, just to not forget the kind of the other threat is that insider threat. Again, disaffected employees, yeah. people wanting to whistleblow, whatever reason, there's lots of reason that insiders might take data and, and mm. share those in, in, a, in a wrongful way. But that kind of insider threat mm. can often be forgotten because they're so focused on the external threat. But yeah. that kind of people side and the insider threat, I think, Some, is, sometimes is just as important. The, the threat is accidental or the leakage Absolutely, is yeah. accidental, mm. as you say, through an email and clicking on links. And sometimes it's deliberate because disenfranchised employees and and so on can be or sometimes it can even be I'd imagine if someone is moving from one firm yeah. to another and they decide yeah, to take data. the database common, with them yeah. or whatever mm. so, very, so much around a lack, of, lack of training as well mm. you've got a new member of staff and they've been asked to do something for, for a manager yes. say, oh, can you just get this organized and hasn't realized the sensitivity of the data that they're holding yeah. um, and perhaps has sent it out with to multiple people with CC and hasn't realised mm. that someone on that list was external, mm. and all of a sudden the data is out the door. Yeah, so it, it, people should not dismiss uh, um, cybersecurity as being a technology thing. It's a, an important part of it is around people as well. I, I completely agree. I've seen that numerous times myself. So um, what does uh, good cybersecurity look like then, Kirsten, if I could ask you first? <laughs> Where do we start? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, yeah. um, certainly at ICW, the last few years, we've been doing an audit insights sort of research series, if you like, which is bringing together the top six audit firms in the UK. And they've shared their experience of what they're seeing in boardrooms, particularly in terms of managing cyber risk and managing cybersecurity. And from that, we've looked at what the issues are and kind of tried to define what's good and what does good look like. Oh, I see. And I would say that three messages come out clearly. One is that idea that it is a bad business. This is not something that sits with the CIO or sits with the IT person and it's a box mm -hmm. and no one else ever bothers about it. It has to be integrated into everything you do. If you're innovating, you're looking at a new product, you know, are you thinking about the cyber risks around that? You're buying a company, are you thinking about the cyber risks around that? So everything you do has to have that cyber component and it has to be led by the business and not just put in a box or in the corner that that's about IT. So that's absolutely essential. Mm -hmm. Another part is that cybersecurity is broader than just kind of thinking about prevention. 
because in the real world and organizations are complicated, there's data all over the place, there's devices all over the place, you know, accidental breaches are going to happen. Mm -hmm. So you need to be ready to cope with that. Uh -huh. So there's sort of the idea of the security and, and managing cyber risk goes beyond just trying to prevent breaches, but having the intelligence in the first place to focus your resources and understand where your greatest risks are. Yeah. And then thinking about what you do in the event of a breach, detecting breaches. So often we see when breaches have happened, the attackers have been in systems mm -hmm. for months and months before yeah. anyone's detected them. So how do you know whether you've been breached? And what do you do if there's business disruption? Do you need to tell customers? Do you need to tell regulators? That kind of thing of how do you actually think about it as a whole? Yeah. That's increasingly important. But then finally, you just can't get away from the fact that you've got to get good basic security right. I know there's a statistic we always quote from GCHQ a number of years ago that if you get you know, your good basics right, you'll stop 80% mm -hmm. of breaches. Um, and I think that's still true today. And most organizations still struggle to get good basic security right. Partly because it's about people and passwords yes. and this kind of stuff. Yeah. Partly because large organizations just have really complex IT infrastructures and it's mm. just expensive and time consuming to get all this stuff right and smaller businesses don't have the time they don't have the skills they don't necessarily have it as a top priority so just getting that basics right is a is a really important place to start so you might sometimes think it's really hopeless there's all these threats what can you do about it well actually just getting basic security right gets you a long way the way there yeah i think even you know even um uh, smaller firms can have quite complex mm, IT. And absolutely. To, to, exactly. to bigger You've got lots of different applications, lots of different providers. Yeah. You know, it is quite complicated to understand all of that. Paul, you do this sort of thing for a living. You do it all day long. What, what, are, what are the good examples that you've seen of uh, good cybersecurity, you think? And the good examples are, are generally those businesses that are well organised. And when I say well organised, they understand their systems. Right. So if I'm going into an organisation and I ask for, well, can you provide a network map? and they provide a nicely annotated network map with mm -hmm. everything in terms of all the external points of exit to the, into the internet, where their data is being kept, what's the nature of the data. Um, you don't always see too many of these, <laughs> um, but when you see them, you think, fantastic, you know, yeah. because they have got a good understanding of their systems. And the right. person just said, it's, it's, even small firms can be really quite complex. Mm. Um, Archival is one of the issues that we see. People archive things away, and then it's almost as if it's forgotten. It's you know oh. they've archived it away, but actually it sits there as a vulnerability. Yeah. It's still potentially personal information. Yeah. So we we have seen a lot more emphasis in terms of understanding data because of GDPR. That that has oh, that see. has yes. that has yeah. encouraged a lot of organisations to really understand where it all is, mm. and then. Who can have access to it is another key issue, yeah. making sure that that is actually structured. Um, the key thing that I see that's, that's often not done well is simply patching of applications. Yeah. Software yeah. patching yeah. is Updates, probably yeah. the number one problem. Mm. And people say, well, if the software works, why, why am I worried about it? Mm. Well, constantly you're finding vulnerabilities are being discovered with applications, mm. and that's what the patching's all about. Yeah. Um, so my, my number one, well, if it, what does it look like? Good software patching. Mm. And you mentioned a couple of things there, access control, software patching. They're very much embedded into the 10 step cybersecurity, the core basics. things that you need to do, the basics that you need to protect yep. your organization. Do those well, and you're looking to protect yourself for up to 80% or so with the common vulnerabilities, I think, today. It was interesting. So um, how, how do organizations uh, compare themselves? How, how do they benchmark themselves, understand if they're doing this uh, well? Paul, if I could uh, start with you on that one. What do people, what do organizations do to do that? Well, th this, this is a real challenge for organizations because, again, you've got, you've got obviously a very broad range of organizations mm -hmm. out there. Those that will have a lot of IT skill set in, in place, they will have ownership at board level of, of um, systems and, and um, cybersecurity generally. So they will know what they're about altogether. The real problem is for smaller organizations mm. that are concentrating on service delivery, that's what they're doing, product yes. manufacture, whatever it Talking might be. Talking to their clients, yeah. And someone yeah. says cybersecurity, then, and it, they will draw a blank face. Mm. So how can they start is often the problem, and they need 
to get away from their blank sheet of paper and they need to look to something to give them some guidance. And certainly standards are one way of, of being able to benchmark from one organisation to another. And the advantage of, a, of standards is that you don't have to reinvent the wheel. You, know, you don't have to you know, bid with 10 steps with cyber essentials. They are straightforward. Um, I wouldn't say they're simple necessary to implement, but they are straightforward for most people to understand, mm. and it's a way forward. So in terms of benchmarking, if an organization has got Cyber Essentials in place, or ASME, or ISO 27001 at the, the larger scale, mm. they can compare very, very easily mm. uh, with each other. You, uh, I think quite a few people will be familiar with ISO 27001. It's a globally recognised standard for approaching uh, cyber security and information protection. So cyber essentials, just give a little bit about the, the background to, to that as well. Well, interesting enough, there's more companies have gone through cyber essentials than ISO 27001. Right. But it is well known because of the size of organisations that normally adopt, adopt it. Mm. Cyber Essentials was developed back in uh, June 2014. The Institute played a role in um, feedback with the government, working with um, the way in which Cyber Essentials finally um, was um, developed and, and um, produced. And essentially what it's about, and essentially is very much what it is about, it's the minimum that you ought to be trying to do to protect yourself from um, cyber threats. Right. One of the disciplines, there's five disciplines, uh, one of the disciplines we just mentioned is software patching, but just having malware in place, uh, access control, secure configuration, right. and making sure that your boundary to the internet is properly configured. Mm. One key message about it is that it doesn't necessarily cost a great deal to do. And to actually achieve the accreditation, it's £300 as an online fee. Oh, I see. And it's about configuring your existing system. It's not about going out and buying new software or new hardware. Right. It's about making sure it's properly configured. So it's and quite accessible for smaller firms. Then. It's very accessible from, from literally one man bands yeah. all the way through, and I think even Barclays and Vodafone have it. So mm -hmm. it's very broad as well. Okay, it's good. Kirsten, any other thoughts about benchmarking? And yeah, no, I, I mean, I agree it is a, it's, it is a real problem because we're often asked by you know, organisations of all side, how do I know whether I'm doing the right things and mm. spending money in the right areas? And it is hard because people classify security in different ways, everyone's got different structures, different industries, and standards are you know, absolutely very helpful. The other thing that comes up a lot is information sharing, mm -hmm. and that's something that probably goes against the, the, the grain, if you like, of security. You don't ever really want to share your security information with other people, no, do you? No. But certainly good organisations always cite this as really important building, whether that's through sort of building informal networks, whether it's through joining more formal networks, certainly industries, financial services, for example, have forums where you sort of share information about right. what's going on and what you're doing, and it sort of helps to build that trust and confidence. The UK government has a, has a scheme itself for people in the UK to help share information around what they're seeing and just to help build those networks and to help to people to see what other, help, you know, seeing what other people are doing and to build that kind of understanding. Mm -hmm. Are there any lessons we can learn from uh, abroad, for example? Is it not just a UK thing, it's a global effort and the problems being faced by other countries. Have we ever looked uh, internationally on, on uh, uh, what other countries are doing, for example? No, I, th I think, I mean, every, I mean, cybersecurity in many ways is the same all over the world, good practice is the same all right. around the world. And I think everyone is struggling with the same kinds of questions. I think certainly the role of regulation and things like GDPR is an important lesson actually that everyone's in many ways looking to Europe for but, and people are looking to develop similar yeah. laws because it's a bit of a patchwork around the world when you look at policy and the role of policy and trying to drive change and improve practice is something we certainly see different approaches around the world and, and how you do that. And mm. said some countries are further ahead than others. Yeah. Yeah, in that. Mm. obviously GDPR in the UK and the mm. across, across Europe, Europe has been yeah. a driver for mm. improving mm. security there mm. as well. So um, uh, another question then, uh, Paul, what are the uh, uh, key things that members should consider? What are, what are the top three recommendations or just things to think about within an organisation when they're talking about cyber security? Um, well, I think probably first of all, somebody needs to be appointed to be responsible for it. It yeah. uh, doesn't matter what size organisation, someone needs to understand that they have got this job to fulfil. And it may be um, that they do not themselves have those skill sets. Um, so they need to plug the vacuum that might exist in the business. Could be that they have some IT people. Um, it's more likely, especially in the small and medium-sized organisations, that they rely upon external providers. Of course, yeah. And it, 
making sure that they are actually supporting the business in the right way is, is, is key. Mm -hmm. You know, IT has always been a little bit of a dark art to, to a lot of business owners, a lot of um, well, chartered accountants as well, to be fair. Mm -hmm. And you need to challenge the providers to make sure that they are actually providing you with good quality advice. Yes. Um, it varies greatly in my, my experience in visiting firms to, to assess against Cyber Essentials. And the external support that they receive varies hugely. Mm -hmm. um, and, I, and I would definitely find a way, I would definitely recommend that the members ought to look at, and business owners ought to look at exactly what they are getting. Mm, okay, yeah, because so much reliance these days on external providers of all sorts of sources, resources and services, and it makes a lot of sense. Um, and just thinking a little bit about smaller firms, obviously a huge number of our members operate within smaller practices or, or, or with, embedded within smaller businesses. What sort of uh, help is available for uh, smaller firms? Well, um, we have our own guide here at ICW, which is available to... Um, I everyone and outside our membership as well I believe right yes. um, on the 10 steps to cyber security for small firms that's very much based on those basics we talk mm. about doing the basics well what are the basics so that's very much our definition of what those kind of 10 basic steps are yeah. for organizations and explained you know hopefully uh, simply to help them get started and um, the UK the National Cyber Security Centre also has a lot of very good advice and just practical tips and help for anyone mm -hmm. who wants to look at those. They have a, certainly a section around small businesses and they also have resources for other groups for boards, for example, and good questions boards should be asking to show the kind of the right leadership and to make sure that the board can have comfort that organisations uh, are doing the right thing. So there's a range of advice uh, at the NCSC, which is you know, pr pretty good and well worth having a look at. Mm, yeah, it's accessible to everybody. Mm -hmm. Paul, any other thoughts about advice for, for smaller firms? Um, well, well, I would echo our, our own ICAW um, website. It's, it's, it's got a lot of great information in there and a lot of links to you know, the 10 steps we mentioned already. Mm -hmm. um, NCSC, the National Cyber Security Centre, um, again, the, na the, the hint is in the, in the title. Yes. You know, they have yeah. a lot of information. Yeah. Um, they, they are the owners of the Cyber Essentials um, oh, standard. And so you can, from their website, you can be directed to, to the providers across the country. And there are a lot of certification bodies. You know, my company is one of the certification bodies for the IASME accreditation. There are about 160 of us across the UK. Oh, okay. So if you go onto the IASME website, you'll see a nice map of the UK. You can drill down to your local area and you can find somebody that um, will be able to start the process and help you. Um, and I think they're all very... Um, helpful people they're not looking um, to make this difficult process or and certainly not looking for you to have to spend a lot of money to get to where you want to be as i said earlier mm -hmm. cyber essentials is very accessible both financially and um for for, for most organizations to get do, do you think calm gaining cyber essentials is a way of uh, demonstrating a level of security to your clients helping build some of that trust do you think that's an element of uh, um, undergoing that process and I, I, it's interesting because we we do see um, a number of organizations doing cyber essentials just because it's the right thing to do Right. However, the vast majority are being driven by an external factor. So it's either because they're involved with some kind of public spending organisation or it's part of a supply chain. And the supply chain one is more interesting because that is starting to roll down to providers, professional advisors, um, where, the, where an organisation wants to see all of the organisations that they are involved with, with some level of, of cyber security. Oh, it may be at the... The basic level, which is Cyber Essentials, mm. it may be that they require Cyber Essentials Plus, which is the, the next level up. It requires an independent mm. um, on-site assessment, generally speaking. And of course, you know, organisations have been required to do ISO 27001 if they're part of a much larger enterprise or mm. cor corporate um, supply chain. Yeah, so yeah. we're starting to see Cyber Essentials being a benchmark for organisations to demonstrate this minimum amount of mm. Um, the fact that they've even think the thought about it demonstrates quite a lot for an And it's helping them gain business. So I've heard recently that um, Cyber Essentials are required for uh, local government work, I believe, or something like that. Is that true? Well, if you're, if you're involved in um, 
being with the, the Welsh Government, they've had it as a requirement now for a number of years. Right. Um, the Scottish Government are close to making it very similar, I, I believe, for, for people in the, the, the public supply chain. But the vast majority of work that I do is, mm. is um, driven by public spending. Um, and we've got an organisation recently that's realised that they are not getting tender work. Oh. Um, because they do not have cyber essentials yes. um, on their portfolio, they cannot tick this particular box, mm. and they've seen the tender work actually drop off. Yeah, I mean, it, it just goes to reinforce how cybersecurity is a business risk. It's, a, it's not just a technical thing. It needs to be embedded in an organisation from from top to bottom. And cyber essentials, along with other standards and approaches, can really help an organisation protect itself and potentially even gain business as well. Mm. Kirsten, if I can just finish with you, with regards to uh, resources for, for members, where, where can our members go to look? Well, we have a dedicated page, icaw.com slash cyber. Okay. So all our resources are gathered together and there's information on the standards. There's a 10 steps to cybersecurity. There's a range of other advice and guidance. And there's also the link there to the audit insights research. And the most recent one of those um, is kind of five years on. We've been doing it for five years. So it's quite a good reflection of how far we've come in five years and where we've seen improvements in terms of organisations and what they're doing mm. and where some of the outstanding issues still are and what's still proving very difficult to change in practice, as you said, people's behaviour, things like that. Yeah. Complexity of business is, is making it harder and harder, but it's quite a good reflection on what good practice looks like and, and said what's been achieved in the last five years and what some of the outstanding challenges are. So that's all available at icaw.com forward slash cyber. Thank you very much. So I'd like to say thank you very much to Kirsten Gillen. Thank you very much to Paul Rollison for joining us today. Don't forget to uh, share, like and subscribe this video. As I say, it's the third in the series on artificial intelligence, blockchain and uh, data uh, as today and cyber. And co to come in the future, we've got one more on uh, um, uh, data uh, and that'll be out later this year. Do look out for that video. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.